Talking About Horses, bringing you closer to some of the best horsemen in the world for tips, insights, and stories. Listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle. This is Talking About Horses. Here's your host, Patrick King. Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in to episode number 25 of Talking About Horses. In these broadcasts, I try to bring you some of the best in the industry for tips, insights, and stories. You can listen at home, at work, in the car, or even in the saddle through Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, or directly from our website at pkhorsemanship.com. Calm. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by my friend Jillian Kreinbring. I've been waiting for this episode for quite a while. Jillian has been working with horses her entire life as a trainer, competitor, and educator. Jillian's work with horses draws upon classical dressage principles and her roots in the Western horse arena, as well as from her equine biomechanics education. She actively studies with Manola Mendez, Peggy Cummings, Stephanie Millman, and the late Mark Russell. Jillian makes decisions uh, about knowledge, about what to apply in training, lessons, and lectures by determining if it's in alignment with the horse and human biomechanics and their mental well-being. She believes the deepest and most insightful lessons come from the horses themselves. Jillian, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're welcome, Patrick. It is totally my pleasure and honor. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. So, now, what I read as a bio there, just from knowing you, I know is really nothing of a bio. It's, it's, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. So, for the folks that are listening that maybe haven't met you or don't know much about your biography, do you want to go a little bit deeper for us and maybe start, uh, if you would, at the beginning? How did you get started with horses? Uh, I was very lucky because my whole childhood evolved around horses. So I was born into a horse family, and I had the good fortune of always being surrounded by people who loved horses, people who worked within the industry. And, you know, when I was very young, I was just a little barn rat. <laughs> My family, we did a lot of trail rides, and, you know, we spent every single weekend at a sale barn, and we had hundreds of horses that we would buy and sell that came on and off the property at it was just, it was an idyllic uh, childhood, riding ponies all day long. I was the only child, so really my only friend were the horses. <laughs> and where was it? In Iowa. In Iowa, okay. In great, great Midwest. So, and then a little bit later in my life, um, at the rifled age of eight, uh, <laughs> there was a gentleman who came into my life. His name was Beat Kinsel, and he boarded a few horses at our farm in uh Iowa, and he started to introduce me to um, showing competitively in the Western world, and so I owe a lot of my younger years to the Kinsels for, for teaching me a tremendous amount, and then later on, uh, maybe three or four years later, uh, we became good friends with uh, a horseman named Glenn Meyer and his wife, Joanne, and uh, they helped us delve a little bit more into the show world. And um, we started showing paint horse and quarter horse, and during that time, I met J.R. Reichert and had the good fortune as a 14-year-old to be his working student for a year and went out on the road competing with him, and uh, then I think when I was 16, I officially took in my first training horse from uh, Kinsel Paint Horses, and I had a really nice mare that came, came into training, and we competed her, and, and we were very successful with her show record, and um, it just never really stopped, even though my parents had maybe hoped it would. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still going. There you go. It's still going. You got bit with the bug, and you never got rid of it, right? I never got rid of it, and, and you know, it was it was just really a great childhood. I I did, you know, go to college, and for a very short period of time, I had aspirations of, you know, becoming a a professional uh, with a job that would help me afford my horse habit, and well, that didn't last very long. And <laughs> I went ahead and uh, just devoted myself to my passion and my love, and I feel so grateful for that to have this passion 
and to do what I love every single day. It is a blessing, isn't it? It really is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, so competition was a, a, a very a, a big part of my childhood, and, and I, um, after I graduated from college, I was offered a head training position um, at a quote course ranch, actually, in Germany, and that was a fantastic opportunity for me because it was there that I started to be introduced to more of the classical principles of work mm -hmm. and applying that to Western horses. Um, and then the, the competition world just started to kind of eat away at me because I was seeing a lot of things in the industry that uh, just didn't settle well with me in terms of a value system. Okay. And uh, so I moved back to the United States and I, I had uh, the ambition to go to graduate school and I, I knew I wanted it to be involved with horses, but I didn't quite know what my direction was. Well, while I was waiting to figure that piece of my life out, I continued to train some horses, and I was involved in a riding accident, um, and I broke my back and, uh, and and my leg, and that was a real turning point for me in the horse industry because <clears throat> up to that point, I was kind of an arrogant little brat. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought I knew a lot more than what I did, and uh, uh, so that accident was kind of a gift because I... I realized I really didn't know a whole lot about horses, um, even though they had been my whole life up to that point. So um, that sent me on a completely different journey um, about, you know, learning about horses, learning who they are as a species, both mentally, physically, and spiritually, and that guided my research at the university. And, and so, you know, for the last 15 years now, um, I just try to be beginner's mind every day that I go work with horses and um, continue to learn about how to support them and to be the best steward that I can be, both physically and mentally. Gotcha, gotcha. It's, I, I find it interesting that it was kind of an accident that you say that, that changed your thinking and helped you realize you didn't maybe know as much as you thought you did. And, and I feel like that's almost always the case, right? That's almost always what draws us to find more knowledge like that, either inspiration or desperation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you, do you mind me asking? What what happened, and and why did it cause you to sort of look back on yourself and and your mm -hmm. knowledge or awareness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think you know the way that I was raised around horses um, was based in the paradigm of training from a more dominance perspective, subjugating horses, um, you will do this, you will do that, young horses, wheeling, yearlings, two-year-olds, and just really subjecting them to training practices that took any and if all uh, choices away from the horse. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean to, to bastardize that, that, that paradigm, um, because I think we all come to thinking about the horse world differently at different times in our life. Um, and of course, my accident was the catalyst for me to to change and to explore what other avenues um, were available to me um, at that time in my life. And uh, the accident uh, was we, or I had a horse in training, very nice horse, a six-year-old stallion, and um, the clients, wonderful people, uh, had a buyer for that particular horse, and um, they had a particular training goal for that individual uh, so they could present that horse for sale. So the owner came to take a video, and I was riding in an open field, uh, probably not the safest situation, uh, with a six-year-old stallion that didn't have a lot of time under saddle. And uh, they were videoing, and um, in the past, that field had been uh, used for farming. So there were old furrows in the land, although they were all grown up in grass. And so uh, as she started to video me, I was riding out in that big open field. And, you know, the walk was great, the trot was great, and I picked him up into a canter. And uh, I dropped a rain. And, you know, when you, you're uh, presented with a little situation like that, you, you, your mind goes through all different types of scenarios. And, you know, 
had I been in an arena, it wouldn't have been a big deal to reach down and grab the ring. Um, this unfortunate circumstance, uh, we were about five five strides away from an overgrown barbed wire fence. It was all grown up in grass. Uh, so I opted to just step off and do an emergency discount. But because the land was not flat, when I landed, um, my ankle rolled over and snapped and broke. And then I slipped several times, and that's what caused the, inner, the, the injury. Gotcha. And so, as I said, you know, the, uh, so I was laying there in this tall grass, and shock can be an amazing thing. You know, it, it, you know, when you get injured, nature has a, an incredible way of soothing the body, even though it's in immense pain. And, and that's really when I realized, when I was laying there with that injury, it just dawned on me that, wow, everything that I had done with horses up to that point was absolutely 100% driven by my ego. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so it was the opening and the new beginning for me, although it was very painful, both, both physically and emotionally. Right, right. Well, and there's, there's quite a process, I think, that we go through when we're, faced with that like you said physically and emotionally right you had the physical healing that you had to go through but then the emotional side of things um that's that's definitely one that takes i think a while you can have a decision like that in a light bulb moment you know or right. in the in the blink of an eye like that but for some of us i imagine there's a lot of letting go of things that we thought we knew Absolutely. And it's, it's very interesting because it was as if the universe opened up to me at that moment because just the right teachers came into my life at that time. The right people came into my life to help direct me on a new path. And I am forever grateful to those people like Peggy Cummings who really made me think about and, and really made me see the world of horsemanship from a completely different way. Um, from the horse's perspective, not just about what was good for the horse, but what was good for the rider, both, both equine biomechanics and human biomechanics and how those two things, um, need to, to work together in synchronization to, to have the most harmonious, um, relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it does. It makes perfect sense because if one's not working, the other won't be effective. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so Peggy was the teacher then that first came into your life to kind of help you get on track then? Yes, and it was so symbolic because I was healing from my, from my injury, and I was at the time at the university, and I was still struggling with my primary focus for what my research was going to be. And oh. I was working for a farm at that time in Wisconsin called Busta Farm, and they have uh, Hungarian warm blood. And the woman who was running that farm, Pat Vogel, had asked me, she says, you know, I have a woman who's coming into town um, to teach lessons. Uh, would you be interested in, in taking a lesson? And I said, you know, yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. And so I was getting ready for my lesson. Um, I was at the university, and it was on 9-11-2001. And I had oh, wow. just watched the Twin Towers fall. Wow. As I hopped in my little car and I drove to the farm. And so it was so symbolic because my world was wrapped in two completely different ways. Yeah. So, yeah. So Peggy, you know, she really brought just so much awareness about my own self-healing, my own self-care, and how that was equally as important to the, to, to the horse-human equation. Wow. Wow, that's fantastic. And now you've gone through Peggy's program and you're a, am I understanding right, you're a connected riding instructor also? Yes, I am. Um, so I've been studying with Peggy since 2001. Okay. And, um, and uh, now I am a connected riding instructor. So pretty much everything that I teach um, is always going to be reflected back into the foundation of, of what I've, I've learned from, from Peggy. Okay. 
Fantastic. Um, can you tell for any of our listeners out there that maybe don't know, and even for my own knowledge, I know I have Peggy's book and admittedly I haven't yet gotten around to reading it. It's in a, I have a whole suitcase in my car full of books that I have yet to read. <laughs> I know. I, I have told myself I cannot buy any more books until I read at least one. <laughs> right? Yeah. But once you read one, you can buy 10 more. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that I'm not the only one in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, that's great. So, so can you tell us a little bit more about then connected riding? Yeah, um, Peggy uh, is, you know, a lifelong equestrian herself, and uh, she, when she was living in Maine, she um, was introduced to the work of both uh, Linda Tonington Jones and Sally Swift. And so she spent many years studying with Sally and Linda, and eventually she became Sally Swift's head instructor. Mm. And she taught for Sally Swift for many years before she went on and developed her own body of work that she called uh, Connected Writing, which uh, is based on having awareness of one's body, where it is in time and space, and the concepts of having a neutral posture, uh, which is a posture which helps the human not interfere with the natural movement of the horse. Um, it also helps the human's body be in a place so that it can help guide the horse subtly into learning weight-bearing postures. And uh, Peggy then went on to develop um, a bunch of groundwork exercises that are, are very much uh, osteopathic in terms of looking for mobility of joints, mm -hmm. um, as well as based in the Feldenkrais type uh, philosophy of less is more in terms of bringing about more range of motion to joints in the body so that the horse can learn to move and become strong enough to move in a way that makes it easier to carry the horse's weight. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. It's very interesting. Okay. Now, and I know you, you do a lot of teaching and lecturing um, on the biomechanics of the horse and um, movement and kind of that connection in there so when when you say that uh, she's developed this program about uh, or with with the idea of helping the horse to learn how to move better um, how, how does how does that work how do we how do we teach and I know we're kind of jumping ahead here and getting a little bit deep but I'm sure there's other people out there listening uh, right now wondering how do you teach a horse to use themselves that way? Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the primary principles is to to help a horse come into a mindset, meaning um, helping horses work from the parasympathetic nervous system, which is why Linda Tynchon Jones's work uh, is such a nice marriage with Peggy's work because mm -hmm. Linda talks a tremendous amount about facilitating a learning environment so the horse can learn. And I think all great equestrians know this, that, that in order for a horse to learn, it must feel safe and relaxed in its mind and, and in its body. Once that's achieved, and you have specific tools and techniques to help the horse with its spinal alignment. Then the horse is able to engage certain muscle sets to build strength so that it can develop the carrying ability to, to have a rider on its back. So that over time, as the horse becomes more educated and stronger, then the horse has a better chance to have not only a more healthy life, but a more vital life. Um, and I know that sounds very philosophical, 
but really that's the end goal. And something that one of my other teachers says that I hold dear to my heart, and that is Manolo Mendez, who I think is one of the most fantastic horsemen that we have on this planet today, is he will talk about the importance of a movement such as shoulder in. But he, he, he also explains that I might teach 100 horses shoulder in in 100 different ways, mm. but at the end of the day, it's still shoulder in. Okay. So that ability to shape the horse's spine so it can come into a weight-bearing posture can only happen when the horse is operating in relaxation in the parasympathetic nervous system, which then leads me back to why it's so important to have tools in your toolbox by many different instructors throughout the industry um, that can help facilitate that type of relationship with your horses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, because like Manolo says, a hundred different horses, they're going to need a hundred different, potentially a uh, hundred different uh, interactions to help them get into that mental state, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so we talk about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Can you, can you kind of um, distill that down a little bit for us? Can you simplify that for us? Mm -hmm. um, in its simplest terms. Um, I'm going to reference Linda Tyson Jones again. Uh, Linda says when a horse is operating in the sympathetic nervous system, if you can think about your horse as having, having two different networks, wiring networks within, within its body, neurologically, even though there are more. We're just going to simplify and, and, and simplify to the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. Okay. In the sympathetic nervous system, Linda, can, Linda Tonkin Jones will talk about the horse exhibiting behaviors which fall within the five F's. Two of them most horse people have heard uh, flight or fight. Mm -hmm. The other three are freeze. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're walking in the woods, you hear something, it freaks you out, you stop, you hold your breath, you freeze. Right. Horses do the same thing. Then there's also fidget. We see horses that are nervous, that are fidgety, 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 fidgety. Okay, so this, this is an example of horses operating in that fight or flight mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the last F is uh, faint. So if you watch wildlife <clears throat> right before the gazelle gets eaten by the tiger, he faints. Ah, uh, yes. And, you know, we can see that sometimes with horses. The first time they get to the saddle, they lay down. Yes. Oh, right. the tiger's on my back. It's eating me. I'm just going to lend over to the experience. So when horses are operating in that sympathetic nervous system, they have a tendency to become, or they are, more reactive. Hence, they're not really in the state of mind that promotes learning. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, this is where, hey, we've had a glass of wine, and the whole world is great, and my digestive system is working wonderfully, and I can sit down here and listen to this interview and really take this information in. So the parasympathetic system is the, is the part of the nervous system where everything is A-OK. -okay. Everything's cool. Everything's chilled. Here, let me savor my bit. Here, let me relax my body. And, oh, wow, when I relax and I'm zen and I'm chilled, I can really learn. So those are, you know, a gross description of the difference between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, okay. So those five Fs, fight, flight, freeze, fidget, and faint, those we see in the sympathetic nervous system and then the kind of openness to learning and relaxation and maybe we might say curiosity lives then yeah. in the parasympathetic. Absolutely. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. So now the 
hundred dollar question maybe of the evening how do we access the parasympathetic nervous system oh that is a, a great question and again i've learned a lot of tools um from so many amazing teachers but this this particular question um i i, I like to to come to another one of my teachers um mark russell mm. um who we unfortunately lost great 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 coursemen um and that is mark taught uh, something that he referred to as educating the horses to the bridle. And this was first talked about many, many, many years ago by a French classroom master named Boucher. And if anybody who's uh, familiar with Francois Boucher, he's going to talk about things such as jaw flexion. And that can be described biomechanically in a very intimate way, in a very intricate way, and we probably don't have time to talk about so much tonight, but I'll give you the, the, the rub on it. Okay. So the bridal work that Mark teaches, he, he, he talks a lot about when you're educating the horses to the bridle, as you have a soft heel on that inside rein, the only thing that we are trying to communicate to the horse through the bridle with that inside rein is to A, release his mouth or to softly work his tongue as if he is savoring the bit. Mm, oh my gosh, it's delicious. Oh my God. Mm. He just ate the best piece of chocolate in the whole world. That is what the bit is supposed to elicit in the horse's mouth. It is an aid for relaxation. <clears throat> so Mark would teach his students the inside rein is there to help the horse release his tongue, which if you think about the kinematic chain, that is releasing the hyoid bone, mm -hmm. which is attached to the temporalis bone of the skull, which is the upper portion of the horse's TMJ. So once the horse is soft in the mouth, he's working the tongue, he's softening the hyoid, he's releasing tension in the TMJ, then the cascading effect of that is that he will be able to release at what's referred to as the atlanto-occipital joint, mm -hmm. which is the joint between the skull and the first vertebrae of the atlas. Mm -hmm. And the movement that he will make there is that he will make a slight side bend to the inside. Now, when the horse has all of those things happening pretty much simultaneously, what he will do is he will release any tension that he has in the top line. And that will allow him to release laterally and then he can stretch down longitudinally. So you have a horse which is able to bend to the side and also to round his back. Those two things are what Mark was teaching us with his bridal work. And if you can teach the horses that or educate the horses to the bridle in your in-hand work and apply that to your gymnasticizing, the horse then has the ability to learn, to be soft, to be relaxed, to be operating in the parasympathetic nervous system so that we have the ability to help that horse make changes to the shape of his spine so that he can then bear, better carry weight. Gotcha. So then the releasing <clears throat> um, of, the, of the jaw and the atlanto occipital joint, um, which I, I think kind of commonly gets mistaken for the pole, right? Um, so we hear people refer to flexions of the pole, and, and really I think that's what we're talking about, yeah? Yes, that is, that is correct. And that, that's what really gets confusing in the literature, because at the mm. pole, if we are considering where the skull articulates at the first cervical vertebrae, or where where the skull meets at the atlas, that is what's referred to as the pole. Okay. Now that that joint 
can either flex vertically, meaning he will bring his head more on the vertical, mm -hmm. or that joint will allow the head to slightly create a side bend to the inside of the circle. So, for example, when the rider is riding in a lesson and the instructor says, I'd like to see the corner of the horse's inside eye. Well, the horse has to make a movement at this AO joint in order for the horse to produce that gesture. So when the horse gives a side bend at the AO joint, he will also soften and lengthen the outside of his body while he creates a bend. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different things that also go on here, mm -hmm. but that, that's, the, that's what's happening at the front of the horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great kind of starting point to access then the parasympathetic nervous system. That's right. Okay. Because it releases tension. If you think about savoring the bit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So everything, you know, you're happy. So, oh, I'm happy. I'm going to eat, right? You want to eat when you're happy. Things are good. Life is good. You you know, you want to enjoy this nice meal. You want to enjoy this piece of chocolate cake, mm -hmm. right? So you're, you're relaxed and you, you can eat that food. See, when a horse is not relaxed, he tends to tense the jaw, right? Yes. He tends to clamp his jaw together, right? So he's no longer sa savoring the bit. However, he might be chomping the bit, which is a nervous, Mm -hmm. response or reaction mm -hmm. to something that is making him uncomfortable. So would, would you say that that becomes, uh, within Linda Tellington Jones 5 Fs, that becomes kind of a localized fidget response? That's right. Okay. And Mark would very frequently say, most of the literature that we talk, that we read talks mm -hmm. about riding the horse from the back to the front. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree that it is the horse's hindquarters that is, that is the engine. It's what produces the energy. Mm -hmm. But what the classical masters also realized is that if the structures of the horse's head and neck are soft, then you have access to the horse's hindquarters and can ride the horse then forward. And Manolo works in a very similar way, but with a very different... Um, approach because he works so much with the cabathon, which will help the horse bring his spine into alignment. Like he oftentimes will use the analogy like pearls on a necklace. You mm. want all the vertebrae to follow that very first vertebrae, which he so beautifully does with his in-hand work with the cabathon. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, all of these great riding masters are all working towards the same thing. They just might have a little bit of a different technique or a little bit of a different approach. For me, I use biomechanics as, as my floor plan. There can be more than one way to roam. As long as it is in alignment with biomechanics, I'm okay with that. That makes perfect sense. I like the I like the pearl necklace analogy that that makes a lot of sense. I think we can kind of get the picture of that. And so he's talking about the vertebra through the through the body, right through the spine. Exactly. Sometimes Manola will also say, you know, if it, do you remember those? Uh, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but remember those those train toys that you know? There's the engine, and then all the the cars follow behind the engine. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then. And then there's a string, and you can you can pull the engine by the front of the engine, and then all the cars will follow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can create arcs, and you can do serpentines, and all those 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 cars will follow the engine. He often uses that analogy when you're working with the cabathon that the horse will follow that nose and allow his spine to come into alignment. But if you pull the horse from the side, or or, or you pull, which is a bad word. If you, if you pull that, that engine from the side, it'll pull the engine over and it will derail all the cars. Yes. So when we're working with horses, when we're riding horses, when we're training horses, we have to remember that what we're working with is, is spinal alignment. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We, we, we pay a lot of attention on what's happening to the legs, but what's happening with the legs is a byproduct, or at least it should be a byproduct of what's happening with the horse's spine. Mm-hmm. Sure, because the legs aren't even going to work properly uh, if, if the spine isn't working properly. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that comes right back then to the parasympathetic nervous system in that if he's if he's tense and tight there's going to be kind of a a kink in the hose or a, a twist in the the pearl necklace right and absolutely absolutely and mark would talk about that as well i think that was one of mark's one of his his gifts that he that he taught his students was that we're, we're really working with energy here mm-hmm. and and it, as you said if you have a kink in the hose you're not going to have a free flow of energy, and that energy is not going to be able to recycle um, in the way that we want it to recycle from the horse to the rider and back to the horse again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense to to think about it. Maybe a little more challenging when we're when we're actually working with it, right? Right. You know, <laughs> and that's why like people who say they get bored with horsemanship, like. <laughs> My goodness. Like, right, how? I mean, very, yeah, right? Like, I can talk about theory and biomechanics all day long, and, and everybody wants to know how. I say, well, that's what you spend the rest of your life learning. Right. Right. right? Exactly. You, you, you learn how, and what's good for one horse isn't always good for another horse, and what's good for one human isn't always good for another human. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the possibilities are really endless. Yes. Yes. Well, and I love the way that you said it, that the biomechanics – becomes the floor plan and everything else needs to be built with uh with an alignment of that um that that to me makes perfect sense because if you're going if you're if you're trying to get something accomplished but you're working then against the biomechanics well you're you're not going to get it done or if you do you're not going to get it done in a way that's suitable for the horse absolutely it's the foundation and you know if you don't have a strong foundation when we think about that as an analogy, you know that that can, that can go wrong in all kinds of not so happy ways. Right. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. So let's, let's jump back on track here then. We'll, we'll put our train back straight and follow the nose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Peggy and then um, was it from Peggy then that you uh, found out about or, or, uh, learned about, became involved with Manolo? Oh, that, that's a really fun story. Um, I was a working student for Peggy when she lived in uh, Oregon and in Washington. And at the time, I became ridiculously obsessed with Iberian horses. Hmm. And there was a woman. In I can't the imagine house. why. I know, they're just, oh, they're oh, so dreamy. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can hear my obsession. <laughs> um, so, when, when I was in the Pacific Northwest, um, I was taking care also uh, of some Iberian horses for a, a woman who had her horses on like, the island. And while I was there, I had met one of her clients who had purchased uh, one of those Iberian horses. And at the time, I was also doing my, my graduate work at the university. And my primary focus at that time was how movement patterns affected muscle development. So, mm-hmm. for example, when horses move in a healthy posture, their muscles develop in a characteristic way. If horses move in an unhealthy pattern, muscles will develop in another characteristic way. So um, I was explaining this to uh, this client who had purchased one of these Iberian horses, uh, who happened to be from California. And she said, you know, there's this amazing man who talks about the neck. And because you're localizing your research to the horse's neck, I think you really should come down to California and watch one of his clinics. I think you would be blown away by this guy. And sure enough, in 2005, I packed my little bag and I traveled to uh, California and I attended a Manolo Mendez clinic and I was just absolutely blown away 
at his ability to help shape horses in such a kind and correct way and how many different ways that he could do it. Hmm. And so then I became a Manolo junkie. (laughs) And again, it was such a great marriage, you know, um, between everything that I had learned from Peggy and I had continued to learn from Peggy and then layering that into Manolo's work was was just fantastic because they're all operating from the same place of what's good for the horse. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I like, uh, you know, you had you'd mentioned that, you know, when you were ready to learn, when you were open to these ideas, then the teachers kind of started coming out of the woodwork, as they so often do. Uh, Right. What's that? What's that saying? When the student is ready, the teacher will come. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think the at least on paper, as I'm taking notes and and listening through the story, it seems so fitting that you would be learning from Peggy and then taking that and being more open and more able to uh, absorb what it is that Manolo would have had to offer. Absolutely, and because Peggy had taught me so much about how to use my body, and with her groundwork exercises, then I could take that awareness to how I started to learn about the use of the cabazon and how to use my body um, to learn how to use the cabazon as a tool, and then how to use the bamboo, Hmm. and how to use my own energy and body to help shape horses. And... I'm lucky in that I'm a visual learner, so the more I studied Manolo visually, I would start to emulate his movements, and then later I was able to put a feel to those movements. Perfect. And I was able to feel it because of the work that I had done with Peggy. Yeah, so she planted the seed and he helped to add the fertilizer. (laughs) Yes, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think it's really important what you said too about, and, and this is probably a, a little rabbit trail or a tangent, but I think it's really important what you said about um, you are a visual learner and then you were able to put the feel to it. I think, uh, and maybe you have a different opinion on this and I'm, I'm really interested in hearing it, but I feel a lot of students that I work with when they struggle to learn something, a lot of uh, a lot of the struggle comes from not actually knowing how they learn best. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, again, something that we learned as instructors in Peggy's organization is to, to learn about your students. Are they a visual learner? Are they a kinesthetic learner? Hmm. Are they a, an, an auditory learner? Mm-hmm. And to work with that student in their in their area that makes it easiest for them to learn. Mm-hmm. And and I know that I'm a visual learner because my very first teachers, Bede Kinsel and uh, Glenn Meyer and Joanne Meyer and, and uh, J.R. Riker, they never really explained things in depth to me, but they'd always say, watch me. Mm-hmm. Watch me how I do this. And then in college, I worked for Jim Dudley, who was another quarter horse trainer. And Jim would ride with me, and then he would show me an example while he rode. This is how I do this. So there wasn't necessarily step-by-step-by-step-by-step instruction. Mm -hmm. There was demonstration, and there was emulation, and then there was a feeling. So I feel very lucky that I had those opportunities. And in the way that we are so often educated today in the horse industry, we don't always have that opportunity because the clinicians fly in. They might not be able to have a horse or a school is not there to teach. So many instructors now have to rely on on verbal cues to help their students. So um, I think, Patrick, as, as... you're an instructor as I am an instructor you know sometimes we have to become very creative about how we parlay the message not just 
verbally, but also how, how are we going to help students develop the feel for right. right, right. And I think that feel from a, for a student uh, can be so challenging, and it's, it's something that one of my mentors, Ray Hunt, used to say all the time, that you know, you're trying to do something you never did to get something you never had. Mm -hmm. Right. So it can be such okay. a struggle there because you don't know if you're doing too much or doing not enough or doing it too soon or too late or, you know, um, and so having having kind of the schoolmaster horse that a student can climb on and really feel what correct should feel like uh, or what the right answer should feel like, I think is so helpful. And there's so many times students that I work with and, and you know, just talking with people all around the country and all around the world, there's such a lack of that opportunity. And I, I often wonder if that's maybe the biggest challenge that riders have in learning how to improve themselves is that they're, they're hunting for an elusive feel that they don't even know if they've even actually felt it yet or not. I couldn't agree with you more, Patrick, which is why I am sending big kudos for putting the opportunity together for people to go to Europe to ride. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Europeans do have an advantage in that they really understand that. In that there are so many riding schools in Europe that offer students the opportunity to ride school courses. Mm -hmm. They have the opportunity to feel the movement, to feel the softness. And only later in life do those students have the opportunity to actually train that feel into horses. Right. And I think in the last 25 years, our education model hasn't really served the American public in a great way. Because it used to be when I was young, if you wanted to learn about how to ride better or how to become a better trainer, you went and you spent time with somebody who knew more than you did. Not just person, but course. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And somehow, maybe because we've become a more urban culture and we've let go of our rural roots, um, the model shifted to the clinician and not that clinicians don't parlay wonderful information. I'm a clinician, mm -hmm, right. but I also understand how difficult it is if you only see a clinician once or twice a year. Yes. That's a, that, that sets it up for a very difficult learning situation for people. And what I would love to see in this country would be to have regional schools, a school in the north, a school in the south, a school in the east, and a school in the west, mm -hmm. of really solid school courses where people could come and develop a feel for horsemanship. It's that, it, with your mentor, Ray Hunt, he would talk about the soft feel. Mm -hmm. Right, well, what is the soft feel? So many people think the soft feel is having the horse, when they have a connection with the bridle or they take a feel on the bit, that the horse will just come off the bit. Right. So they feel nothing in their bridle connection. Mm -hmm. That is considered soft feel. When in fact, when you listen and you study Bray Hunt, as you well know, when he talked about soft feel, he talked about the horse tucking the jowl under his throat. Mm -hmm. That's true soft feel. Mm -hmm. That's a lateral movement, not a vertical movement. Right. 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 And that's that movement at the AO joint that I was talking about earlier. That is the movement that Mark taught his students, mm -hmm. lateral to longitudinal. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. I talk to Peggy, she has two groundwork exercises called cheek press to caterpillar. It's the same thing. Lateral movement at the AO joint to a lengthening and lowering of the head and the neck, which is a flexion of the spine. In osteopathy, we would say side bend and deflection. Mm. Mandela would say, have the horse follow the nose. Do not ever get the nose past the point of the shoulder, otherwise the horse is too bent. Right. So I, I would, my wish for this country, and maybe someday, um, I would love to be able to have 
uh, a home where people could come and get a feel on some school horses. Yes. Where they could get a feel for these things so that they weren't trying to train the horses and learn the movements all at the same time. Feel the movement, get it in your bones, get it in your cellular memory, mm -hmm. and then later take it to a young educated horse and try to help that horse through different techniques and one learns from their teacher to help the horse progress in its own education. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so then that's our, our business model for the future, right? We're just gonna, we're just gonna start that school. Absolutely. So you better get to train some horses there. <laughs> I think we just need to find some sponsors for that. You know, I, I think okay. that's what we need to look for. Yeah. See if we can find some sponsors. If anybody out there is listening and they're looking to sponsor a regional school of horsemanship, you need to get in touch with Jillian and I. <laughs> that's right. And, and we are currently looking for a new place to house ourselves. So if anybody has any ideas, please. There you go. Perfect. See, see, you had no idea that we were going to be, you know, networking this heavily during this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's always surprising what comes of these talks. <laughs> Isn't it though? But I would love to work with you, Patrick. I think we could create something pretty incredible. Oh, I think so. I think so. And I think we're going to have to talk about that too a little, a little further um, because that would certainly be exciting stuff. So, okay. So that's, that's how you got introduced to Manolo then. And I have Manolo's DVD. And you sure look a lot like that gal he refers to as Gili in the DVD. Is, is, am I correct in, in thinking that? Yes, you are correct. And again, just incredible good fortune on my part. Um, that first clinic where I met Manola, I also met a wonderful woman named Caroline from Proud Horse Connections. And she had this incredible vision because she saw the brilliance of Manola. And she wanted to make his horsemanship available to the world. And um, because she knew of my interest in research and wanting to become a better horse person through education and to educate, uh, she was so kind and she offered me the opportunity to be the student in Manolo's video, which I will forever and always be eternally grateful. Both Manolo, his wife Kate, at the time his his um, protege Chantel Matthews and Caroline have been so loving and so supportive of me and I, I'm grateful every day for having had that opportunity. Yeah, quite an opportunity. And you spend quite a, quite a bit of time with Manolo, correct? I wouldn't say that I spend quite a bit of time. Um, when I get the chance to spend time with Manolo, um, he and his wife have been so generous in opening their home to me and, uh, where I've been able to spend a month at a time being a fly on the wall and just observing this master work. And as I said, that has been great for me being a visual learner and then, uh, him throwing a few lessons in here and there is priceless. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. So now let's talk about our friend, Mark Russell. Yeah. Where did you meet Mark? How did, how did that come about? Mm -hmm. So as I started to teach my biomechanic courses, um, and during this whole time, I continued to, to study with, with Peggy as often as I could. And, in other people in that same vein of thought, um, I started to feel um, somewhat alone in the horse world because I, I couldn't study with Manolo as often as I would like because obviously he lives in Australia mm -hmm. and he, he, he doesn't frequent the United States mm -hmm. often. So I started to look for, for other people and, and Mark's name just kept coming across the the wave line, you know, just kept coming, you know, oh, have you, have you, have you checked out Mark Russell? Have you checked out Mark Russell? And, and I was getting so excited because I started reading his book and like, oh my gosh, that's incredible because the way that he folded in with, um, energy work into his work, of course, was, was really inspirational. 
And I taught my biomechanics course at um, Men's and Senses Farm in uh, Tennessee, owned by Linda and Vic Bertani. Amazing people, completely dedicated to education. They host Harry Whitney for several weeks every year. Um, Linda had hosted me at her facility, and Mark and his wife, Hala, just happened to live right down the road, and they both attended my biomechanics class. Oh, wow. So there I was, you know, teaching a nervous as shit, because <laughs> oh my God, I'm like, <laughs> I can't look at And uh, we just hit it off immediately. His kindness, his gentleness, his, his depth of knowledge, not just with horses, but in life. Yeah. Um, really moved me. And we just had an instant connection on so many levels. And uh, it was later that I was uh, able to go to his house with he and Halen. Again, such generosity. And they opened their doors and they opened their hearts and they opened their minds to me. And being the little sponge that I am, I, I just started to learn as much as I could, and then with my partner, Casey, and I uh, started working at High Court Farm in Cedar Creek, Texas. Uh, it was It's the type of facility where we could host clinics. Um, we thought, oh, let's bring Mark in, and of course, it was to offer the community a wonderful educational opportunity, but there was a little bit of selfishness in there because I wanted to study with Mark as well. Certainly. I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was very, very, again, very fortunate to have Mark move into my life at just the right time to add another incredible layer into the journey. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. I know the time that I spent with him. I, I treasure every moment of it, um, just as I know you do. And it was, there's there's still pieces, you know, that that every day, he helps to make a little more clear. Isn't yeah. that true? You know, like I hear his words all the time. And the word I hear the most is him saying to me, softer. Yeah. Breathe. Breathe, yeah. Softer. Yeah. And so I've even contemplated having the word softer tattooed onto my wrist so that when I'm doing gymnasticizing my horse is in hand, when I look down and I, I can only see that word softer. There you go. Oh, wow. Right. So I hear his voice frequently. Yeah. And he was. He was just such an amazing person that when you met him, you, or at least I felt, and it sounds like you felt the same way, when you you met him, you knew him. Yeah. He, he's like, oh, my gosh, I, I feel like I've known this person my entire yeah. life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The first time that I met him, we were actually teaching together at a at an wow. expo kind of clinic setting in Pennsylvania. And so so wonderful. yeah, absolutely. And I had no idea who the hell this guy was. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so yeah, so absolutely. Humble. I had no idea who, who the hell is this guy, you know, and I got introduced to him. And, and then I, <laughs> you know, and it was it was like, oh, well, he's from the moment meeting. He's a very good friend. He and Halo both, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, you guys, I've known you forever, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then thank God for Google, you know, and, and all of that oh, stuff. And yeah, I mean, just amazing, but you're right. You, you would have so humble, you know, so there, oh, there was God. no, there was no negative ego in there whatsoever, you know, and, and I think yeah. that's, part of uh, what made him so effective as a teacher of, of the horses and of the riders. Yeah, and just an enormous amount of patience. Yeah, yeah. As well as with all my other teachers, they've just been incredibly, <laughs> especially with me, incredibly patient Yeah. Teacher. Yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, I'm I'm looking at our time here, and I know we had said that we wanted to kind of stay within a time window, and unfortunately, we are already coming close to that window, um, which is common for me with these discussions, you know? I should just start making a day of them, and that's it. It's just a whole day. <laughs> We're going to, I think I should do them live. Just schedule them where we get together, and that's what we do. We just, all day long, we talk in front of a camera for everybody. 
that's that's I, what we'll do. <laughs> well, you know, I just have to give one more shout out, Patrick, and that's to Stephanie Milham. Mm, yes. Because that was another teacher that came into my life after Mark and and right before Mark ascended. Um, I met Stephanie, and she's in the same vein as Mark with her gymnasticizing courses um, with the in-hand work. And again, just an incredibly benevolent teacher with tons of knowledge and no ego. And um, so I currently continue to study with Stephanie as well and feel equally as blessed to have her in my life. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And we did talk about doing some question and answer, and there's a boatload of questions that have come in that would <laughs> easily, that would easily take us another hour to get through. And so many, many apologies to everybody who has sent these in that we're not going to get to, but I promise I'm going to hold Jillian to getting to your questions. I'm going to make sure she comes onto this broadcast afterwards and, and <laughs> gets a chance when, when you get a chance, no pressure. I've just announced to like 5,000 people that you're going to be personally answering their question though. <laughs> no pressure. Well, if, if you want to do another question and answer, I'm happy to do that after you have your other interviews with I think I think that would be fantastic. I think that'd be fantastic. So you guys heard her make the offer that we're going to do just a and a session with Jillian. I think that's going to be amazing. Um, but one question that I am going to let squeak through here because I do think it's very, very important. Um, Casey sent in a question. How can we find all of these people that Jillian talked about? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so... Uh, Peggy Cummings, uh, you can check out Peggy Cummings online. Um, her body of work is called Connected Writing. Um, you can look up connectedwriting.com. Peggy has several certified instructors, my colleagues that I cherish with all my heart. Um, uh, Diane Seth, who specializes um, with gated horses and horsemanship in general. Absolutely amazing human being and instructor. Another great colleague of mine who is a connected writing instructor, uh, Debbie Bowerman Davies. Um, incredibly talented body worker, comes with a ton of knowledge in the eventing world, dressage world, craniosacral world, also a connected writing instructor. Um, I have a, 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 a couple other instructors in the organization. For those of you who do not live in, in the United States, um, not a transfer in Scotland, a funny, funny person, also an incredibly gifted teacher. She's able to articulate uh, Peggy's concepts in a, a very wonderful way. And uh, we have another instructor in Montana, Laura Faber Morris, who is also a Masterson Method um, practitioner and uh, very involved in the teamwork and a connected writing instructor, very gifted instructor. And I'm happy to say we have two new instructors, um, Mandy Pretty, who is Linda Tellington Jones's niece, who has just been born into the clinician lifestyle. So she is a professional through and through, great knowledge of gated horses again very clear, articulate instructor, and uh, Sue Faulkner March, who is also a Canadian, and Mandy Pretty is also a Canadian. Again, an incredibly articulate woman, also a centered writing instructor, um, and just has a tremendous amount of tools that she can pull from to help writers um, learn more about their body and horses. So you can look all that up on Peggy's website. Uh, you can also go to Mark Russell's website, Mark Russell Natural Dressage. Mm -hmm. um, Kayla, uh, Mark's wife, is uh, very, very busy and very, very dedicated to completing the uh, rewrite of Mark's book. Um, she's adding uh, new information, uh, massaging old information. She and Mark were in the middle of that project um, before he passed. And so she's going to be adding new information and updating that book. It is bound to be a classic hit, no doubt. Certainly. 
Absolutely. Um, so I would definitely continue to look for that um, coming out later this year. Um, and I do believe Hale is also going to be working on um, more video uh, that she has been able to to collect throughout the years of, of Mark's uh, teaching to offer to the public. Manolo Mendez has an amazing Facebook presence. Um, if you go to Crowdforce Connection, um, that is uh, by Caroline, um, or you can go directly to Manolo's website, uh, Manolo Mendez Dressage. You can order his in-hand DVD, which gives you access to this incredible, off-the-chart Facebook uh, group. Uh, once you buy the DVD, you can um, become a member of this group. And the, the educational material that is shared there is just off the charts. It is incredible. So, it's hard sometimes it, to keep up with it all. It is incredible. Oh, it is. It, it is yeah. by far the, one of the best models that is in the industry for disseminating information. Yes. So that's run by Caroline and the Nola's wife, Kate. And they have wonderful contributors there. Um, Dr. Fiona Mead from New Zealand. Um, also, a shout out to Equinology. Uh, they do a lot with uh, Manolo and his wife. A shout out to Manolo's protege, uh, Chantal Matthews, who is starting her own training program. Super, super talented young woman and, and sharing uh, Manolo's teaching. And lastly, uh, uh, Stephanie Milham. Stephanie, Stephanie is a little bit more private. Um, she does have a website. She's just starting to write another um, newsletter. She used to, to be heavily involved in um, Xenophon Press, doing a lot of edit, editing for that company. Extremely knowledgeable, very humble, quiet woman. Um, you can check her out on her um, on her internet page. I'm getting tired of the internet page. <laughs> her website? Goodness <laughs> gracious. Uh, you can check her website at uh, Stephanie Milham. And she also does have some venues that she teaches in consistently at our dear friend's um, a farm near Dallas, Texas, at Jeanette Wright, Firefox Ranch uh, and Lamp, who, is, um, who does a wonderful body of knowledge uh, working with horses called Slow. Patrick, that might be a really good interview for you too. Ooh, to thank follow you. Up on. Um, they just hosted uh, Magdalene and Frederic from Cavalia. Ah. Um, but uh, Stephanie teaches there probably eight times a year. And I believe she also teaches several times a year in Colorado. And then I'm a spoiled little brat because she, she does make time to come and teach me privately here at the beautiful High Court Farm. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. So those are our leads. And then, of course, Linda Tarrington Jones has a plethora of mm -hmm. information out there available to people. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into our wrap up questions. Okay. So, yes, if there is one specific thing that you would recommend that riders focus on as a way of improving their horsemanship, what would that be? Awareness of their own bodies and awareness of the horse's bodies. And I'm probably a little um, prejudiced here because I see the world through a biomechanics eye. But what biomechanics has done for me, both, both for horse and human, is that by understanding the human body better, and understanding the horse's body better that helps riders make discerning choices about what techniques and training modalities that they apply to their horses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, like you said, that's the, that's the foundation. That's the floor plan. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. If you could ride with anyone, past or present, who and why? Oh, Patrick. 
First one to pop into your head. Oh my gosh. Um, I have a feeling um, you're going through a mental Rolodex right now. I am going through a mental Rolodex because there are a lot of people that I, I have a high amount of respect for. Um, in terms of training, um, I would, if I could, spend every moment I could with Manola. Mm. Nice. In the way that he trained horses. Yes. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. What is your current personal definition of horsemanship? Again, I piggybacking on the first question that you asked me. I would say horsemanship involves awareness. Awareness of what's good for the horse physically, psychologically, and spiritually, as mm. well as the human, in terms of taking care of our own bodies, our own minds, and our own spirituality. And as Peggy would often say, she says, so many horsemen will spend their last dime on getting body work or tax for the horses, but they will not spend it on themselves. Yes. And we have to remember that it's a partnership. Exactly. And it's like calling the kettle black, right? Because it's still, a, it's still something that I have to work on myself. You know, I'm not always the best to myself. And, and I'm fully aware of it. Um, but really, I mean, I think to, be, to, to become a really good horseman, um, it's about awareness of both horse and human. Yes. So true. So true. Well, that's why we don't just call it horseship, right? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> awesome, Blossom. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so what book are you currently reading or have you recently read? Because I know you've got the suitcase full of them like I do. But what, what one are you currently trying to read or did you recently read? Well, I have this terrible habit of starting like several. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. I don't know what you're talking about. Like overstimulated. Oh my god, I can't take that in right now. <laughs> okay, what seven are you currently reading? <laughs> well, um, I just discovered that uh, Steinbrecht's Gymnasium of the Horse is available through audiobook. Yes, it is. So I have currently downloaded that, and I listen to it as I am grooming the arena with the little four jubilee and the TR3. Nice. Yes. Nice. So I'm, I'm hot and heavy in that, uh, which I think is just really cool because it's so much of a historical account in that book. Um, it's just, it, it, it's both interesting from a, horse, a horsemanship perspective as well as a historical perspective. Yes, absolutely. That's one that I have queued up as well. I've got six or eight different ones that I listen to on, on repeat as I drive from one side of the country to the other. Uh, oh, I know. I'm like, oh, look at that. And then I, like, read the whole chapter. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> right? Right? Well, thank goodness that we can re-listen. Oh, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, that is a great one, though. I definitely, I recommend that for everybody as well. That's a great one. That's a great one. Okay, so we talked about how folks can find your mentors and the other folks that you work with. We really didn't spend any time at all talking about what you're teaching and where you're teaching and what you're doing and things like that. So I'm going to make sure that everybody knows they have to find you on Facebook through JK Inspired and also through your website. How else can folks find you or what's the best way for folks to find out about you and what you're doing and how can they reach out to you? I am the luckiest girl in the world because my partner Casey is a contact person for me. She is totally amazing. She does my calendar. She answers so many of my emails and my calls. So most likely, if you email me at jkinspired 
inspired, or info at jcranberry.com, Casey's going to be the first person to receive that, and uh, that's a wonderful way to contact me. Otherwise, you can check me out on the internet um, or on Facebook. I uh, don't have as strong of a Facebook presence as I should, uh, but that's hard to manage because I'd really rather spend my time on a horse or with a horse. So, yes. um, I'm not as plugged into social media as I should as a businesswoman. I'm just not willing to give up my horse time to do that. Well, we're going to talk uh, about that after, too. We're going to work yeah, on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a hard one to tell. Really yes, in. absolutely. Really, uh, Casey Jones is my contact person, and uh, I think she's going to be somebody you're going to interview here sometime in the spring as well. Yes, I'm so looking forward to my chat with Casey as well. Absolutely. Uh, amazing person, amazing osteopath and trimmer and organizer for me. So she's my first person that... If you want to get in touch with me, um, you probably talk to Casey first, again, either through email um, or through the website or through Facebook. Yes, perfect, perfect. All right, and I'm going to put in a little plug there because I know that you're, you're not really going to put in the plug for yourself because that's how you roll. I get it. <laughs> it's okay. I get it. But... Um, I feel so fortunate, this maybe is good or bad to say, I don't know, that I had a clinic of my own cancel on me at a fairly last minute last year. And that was the first opportunity that I got to actually meet you and spend time with you uh, during your course, during your lecture that you gave. Um, the Understanding Equine Movement to Realize Your Horse's Potential course. And I'm pretty sure I've recommended that to everyone I've ever met in my entire life at least 15 times. Uh, Thank you, it's Thank you so much. for, and I, I have to say this because I know that Jillian won't say this, but um, it's an amazing course and I recommend it to everyone. It's something that I think, again, I'm a little bit of a nerd uh, and I do totally believe that the biomechanics has to be the foundation for all of it. I love the way that you said that. Um, but it's, it's a course that everybody should take. I think you should have to take it if you have horses, uh, or if you have an interest in them, because it will change the way that you look at the horses. It will alter the way that you ride. I promise. Um, and you know, the 17th time you take it, maybe you'll be able to absorb everything. <laughs> Uh, well, no, it's it's absolutely the truth, and I look forward to taking it several times if I can have uh, the opportunity to do that. So I, I really look forward to doing that again, and it, you know, I look forward to just running into you again and, and having the time to just visit. You know. Yeah, me so. too. I just yeah, I really look forward to that, and and it, I, I I should mention that um, in. April, I'll be speaking at the American Hope Conference Association as a speaker, which is an honor. And then from there, I'll be speaking at, at the Equine Affair in Ohio. And something that I'm super, super pumped about and excited about is in um, May, um, I'm going to be teaching alongside of Ivana Ruddock during the okay. Texas in Cape May. Um, and uh, that is going to be just a wonderful experience. Even though I'm teaching, I'm also just so excited to be learning from Ivana. She does amazing horse dissection, so clear, so precise, and such a nice, nice person. And it will be hosted at an incredibly beautiful facility in New Jersey. So um, I'm not sure if the clinic is full or not. If not, um, if you can get on, on board there, it would be, it would be really uh, a wonderful thing to experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, absolutely, on all of those. That's going to be fantastic. And now I'm thinking I might try to scratch a clinic so I can go to the Equine Affair, too, and see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and, you know, another really fun clinic this year, I mean, I have lots of things. You can check them out on, on, on my website and see what the calendar is. But we're trying a new format at um, Menton Sensen's Farm with Linda and Vic Bertani, um, doing more of a comprehensive course, like a four or five day course, 
Mm-hmm. Which I think really helps people learn because they have the continuity. Um, and it'll be more of a family format. We won't take a lot of students. So it'll be a lot of hands-on, just more intimate, chilled. They have an incredible facility. You eat together, you get to sleep together, you can play horses together. And uh, Linda and Vic also um, host uh, Harry Whitney for six uh, weeks out of the year, and they just wow. do a fantastic job. Wow, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. I hope that uh, hope that some of our listeners uh, definitely go hunt for that information and sign up for that one. That's I I guarantee if I had the time I would be there for that as well. So that's fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. Someday we'll hook up Patrick. I'll get to one year clinic. We will make it happen. We will we make will it happen. Ha- I mean we have to plan for, for you know the the schools that we're gonna be starting. You know? I here, here. <laughs> there you go. Perfect, perfect. Okay. okay, so Jillian, one last thing before I let you go because we're riding the edge of that time that I promised we'd stay within here. Um, Every episode, uh, at the end, we ask the question of the day. And this is a question that the listeners have to answer. The catch is, you're the one that gets to ask the question of the day. Doesn't matter what it is. What's our question of the day? What can you do for yourself? to make you a better person for your horse. I absolutely love that. What can you do for yourself to make you a better person for your horse? Gang, you heard the question from Miss Jillian Kreinbring. Please be sure to give us your answer there. I'm looking forward to the answers and I'll make sure that we forward them on to Jillian so that she hears those as well. Jillian, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Patrick. It was a total honor, and I so look forward to our future gatherings together. Absolutely. As do I. As do I. And thank Thank you you. so much for what you do for the horse community. It is greatly appreciated. And you as well. And you as well. So I'm looking forward definitely to uh, not only to the chance that we get to hang out together, but to our next broadcast, that we make a big Q&A broadcast um that i think we're going to get flooded with so that's going to be so much fun i know it i know it very cool well thank you so much patrick i i really appreciate you taking the time absolutely thank you jillian you have a great evening you too good night everybody have a good one (laughs) okay gang thank you so much for lending jillian and i your ear and for tuning in to episode number 25 here of talking about horses through whatever platform you're listening please be sure to give us a rating comment a review and a share your word of mouth is the feedback that fuels this fire make sure you tune in next time gang thanks so much thank you so much for listening to this episode of talking about horses with patrick king if you enjoyed today's show please leave a review and subscribe for more great content and to stay up to date visit pkhorsemanship.com we'll catch you next time